peace, which is the universal greeting of all the prophets, from Adam to Muhammad. Moses, who brought along, he said peace. Joseph, who received, well, not David, who received the songs, he said peace. Jesus, the Christ, the one they wrote the gospel about, he said peace. And Muhammad, he said peace. And now we're all looking for universal peace that the world can seem to give. My focal point today will be speaking about the SARS-2. Because as Brother Patrick said and Brother Tijino said so eloquently, if we go to the ICJ, it will take at least maybe perhaps five to ten years. In the interim, when the model will be consolidating its its itself on the SARS-2 area. We use the term disputed areas. We use the term, we use the term, it's a disputed area. That was the reason why, um, well, that was one of the rationale that the government of Belize used when they passed the statutory instrument that banned us from going to the SARS-2 was, it was a disputed area. But if you follow that rationale, the PG is a disputed area, Bill uh, is a disputed area. If that's the case, then why is it that, what is so special about the SARS-2, why we can't go there? The reason why the SARS-2 is important and the central to this issue is because it's part of the Guatemalan legal and military strategy to take to the ICJ. The SARS-2 area is, if you've never been down there, it's a river that's, that's part of our furthermost boundary, the southern deep south, because, you know, right? The river itself and across there's a village called Sarasu village where I've been to that village, had dinner with the people, talked to them, took photos with them. So the people have no problem with us. It's the military oligarchy in Guatemala that has the issue with us. And um, coming back to my point about the SARS-2. So as Brother Patrick and Brother Hegina was saying, we have, you know, okay, in 1981, we received our independence with all our territories intact. Sovereignty, no question of any border dispute. Well, the border dispute, but no question of what those international borders were, except for Guatemala's deference. But yet and still, we have done everything in our power to unravel that reality. Think about that for a second. We are we have tried to do everything in our power to unravel that reality that we have international recognized borders from Aquas Tobias. To Gobert, that's up, uh, up north, to Gobert Falls, out west, to Rancis of Dios, deep south. And I've been to all of these markers, so I know what I'm telling you. There's boundary markers there, cement markers that you can physically touch. I went to paint one of them at Gobert Falls recently with Brother Patrick and some other Belizeans who, as part of the BTV, the Belize Territorial Volunteers. We have done everything in our power to unravel it. How? I'm not going to get into the historical aspect of it because my focus is on the SARS-2 of what's happening today. Let's start with the head of a brick wall. The Webster proposal is the blueprint, if you will, for what the powers that be have in mind for Belize. And why I use that as a, as a, as a focal point was, is because if you look at the history of the Mosquito Coast in Nicaragua, where the British had a protectorate there on the Pacific, they, and they gave it back to Nicaragua, as a gesture, said, we don't want to be bothered with the wrangling. You can have back the Mosquito Coast. We've met some of those people, like uh, Ray Hooper and others. We had alliance with some of the people on the Mosquito Coast. So we, the British gave back the Mosquito Coast to Nicaragua, and that's now, even though they have, quote unquote, the autonomy, they're still a department of, of, uh, of Nicaragua. They control their military and their foreign affairs. They may have local government. So basically what the Webster proposal was doing was exchanging Montevo Bactag, as I said. The British, we got South Norway in 1964. So under the Webster proposal, using the Nicaragua and Mosquito Coast as a, as, as a blueprint, they would have given back Belize to what they would have given, not given back, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me use that term. They would have given Belize to Guatemala, exchanging British for the Guatemalans. They, they would have controlled our military and our foreign affairs, but we would still have local, local government or self-government as we had in 1964. 
So after there was a proposal, then we came to the head of agreement. Needless to say, I, I wasn't wrong for the website proposal, but I was wrong for the uh, head of agreement. Needless to say, the Belizeans were very violent against it and they rejected these proposals because they were too very compromising to Belize. Then we, we come to 1993, the Martin Air I'm giving you a, a chronology of how we try to unravel our territorial, hard fought territorial integrity that we won in 1981 at the United Nations. Come back to Martin Harris Act, which essentially said we will delimit our territorial seas down south. We will not, in deference, again, in deference to Guatemala, we will delimit our territorial seas to three miles. While under the UNCLOS, which is the United Nations Charter char of the Law of the Seas, every nation has the God given right to claim 12 miles from their coast. And, our, and they not even have 200 mile exclusive economic zone. But we decided, down in the Sars Tuna area, where the mouth of the river is, we decided to delimit our territorial seas to three miles. And if you go down there, I'm telling you, you will see why the Guatemalans want it. So we delimited, we delimit our, our territory. We made it a law under the Martin Ayers Act. We made it a law that they can, that Belize will delimit out of deference. We're not going to claim more. Then we let's move on. 2000, we started what is called a facilitation process, which we try to negotiate with the Guatemalans. I use the word negotiate because think about that word negotiate with the Guatemalans. It's kind of like, almost like an anomaly because the Guatemalans are serial breakers of every single document, every single proposal that we have signed with them. Period. Irrefutable. They do not respect any document or any agreements that they signed with the lease. So we started the facilitation process. All right, fine. We went up to what is called a CBM. Let's do confidence building measures. This was in 2005. Asad Shuman, professor, or not professor, but Dr. Asad Shuman was the sig signature negotiator in that agreement. I have a lot of respect for that brother, but whenever I see him, I always tell him, that I don't agree with what you did. He, he agreed to what is called an adjacency zone. Now let me explain that. What do I mean by that? This adjacency zone goes from up north, Aquarius Provias, to Garbage Falls, out west by Benke, Bayo, Guatemala border, to Gracias and Dios down south. We're talking about one kilometer on both sides. I'm standing here, so one kilometer on both sides. 100 miles long, about the size of Cayman. In deference to Guatemala again. There we go, you see the unraveling going. So, let's move on. So, we, fought, we, we signed this agreement, which brings us to the famous compromise that Brother Eugenio was talking about, Professor Eugenio talked about. Under this compromise, we, we said that, no, we already, before I get to that, let me just, I don't want to rush to get to that, but let me go back to the confidence building measure. What we essentially did, again, under those confidence building measures, is that we blurred the lines of our international borders in the eyes of Guatemala. Because the document itself, if you look at it, one of the articles, I'm, one of the articles, I think it's Article 7, I'm not sure, but it tells you that this doesn't mean that you're giving up your borders, but as far as the Guatemalans are concerned, they see it as an acknowledgement that you are accepting, legitimizing their claim. If you decide that you're going to you know, make your international borders an adjacent to mine. Hence the famous artificial borders from the foreign minister. I'm going, I don't know if you guys heard that. He referred to, which is not a, which quote unquote is not a, a wrong term, but if you look at the connotation of what that, of what that uh, means, the deeper metaphor to that, then you can understand why a lot of Belize were upset with that terminology of artificial borders. In any event, so now we come to the compromise in 2008, to be exact. This was when we signed this compromise that says we're going to take this case to the International Court of Justice. Contingent upon a simultaneous referendum in both countries. Okay, fine. One was scheduled for October 6, 2013. A simultaneous referendum in both countries. It was all geared up. You know, the, you know, the MFA, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, was doing the education campaign. And it was all 
we were all set to go to the referendum in October 6, 2013. What happened? Remember I told you that Guatemala is a serial breaker of agreement? Well, their current president at the time, Otto Perez Molina, who is complicit in war crime, decided that I don't like your referendum law that says you must have a two-third majority. You need to change that beliefs because it's not fair to us. You have a two-third majority referendum law that said no, no referendum would be, would be legitimate unless you got two-thirds of the electorate. So they decided to unilaterally pull out the referendum. So it's like going to, I, well, how would I describe it? It's like going to the altar to get married and you're waiting for your wife, but no wife, girl. No husband then, so to speak, you know. So believe us all, get dressed up with nothing, get, get all dressed up with nothing to show for it because Guatemala decided to pull out of the agreement, the compromise that they signed in 2008 that says that you will have a simultaneous referendum in 20, October 6, 2013. That's just one example of how you cannot trust, I don't trust them, the Guatemala military oligarchy in Guatemala City. Okay, fine. So we, like I said, we have done all these things to unravel our, our international borders with these agreements that we so willingly signed with the Guatemalans, all in the, in the, in deference to them, but in the interest of peace. This peace that I mentioned that the world can't seem to give, that we, we believe that we have a peace partner in Guatemala. Again, in my opinion, I think we don't. But they say one thing, in, when they're in the room with you, they say one thing, the rhetoric outside is entirely different. So it's kind of like when you say dos caras, they have two faces. They tell you one thing here, but up there, stop in your back, basically. That's what the Guatemala, that's how I can describe negotiating with Guatemala has been at this point. Now, again, let me get back to the source too. As part of their military and legal strategy, the Guatemala is using a doctrine called effective control. Now, what do I mean by that? The United, the International Court of Justice has had several instances where effective control was used as a prerequisite to grant those parties that can show they have effective control of a particular territory. Um, two, two cases come to mind, Namibia versus Botswana and Nicaragua and Colombia. How does this work? What they do is, see, under effective control is that you cannot use deadly force so when we went to the SAR student with Brother Patrick, we were blockaded by, uh, there was a huge Guatemala uh, gunboat out there and a lot of fast boats who were there with armed Guatemala personnel, you know, with, with, with M16s, and they were just zipping around. And so every time we tried to go somewhere, every time we tried to uh, maneuver a boat, they were just blocked. In some instances, they were ramming our boats, but they were, the blockade was on. But, we, you know, I mean, it was a lot of Belize, and you could imagine when Belize and get mixed. Well, you know, I mean, it was crazy out there, but we did not back down. And one boat got through, that was by, in Orlando de la Fuente. His boat got through the blockade. And so he went around the SARS-2 island with Guatemala military expert. I mean, export, they were, you know, around, escorting them, sorry, escorting them around the, the, the island, as it were. So, but you would have thought that maybe they would have opened fire or they would have shoot one of us. Or, but it's a very delicate line because under effective control, you cannot use deadly force if you say something belongs to you. If you say this is, our, this is yours, my house, I don't need to use deadly force to take you out. I don't need to, to, to aggress you physically to take you out. And so that's the doctrine that when you look at the case of Botswana, Namibia and also Colombia and Nicaragua, under effective control, the Guatemalans take this to the ICJ and they use what is called customary law. If you're familiar with customary law, customary law is like, okay, if something is part of your custom, you need it to survive, you need it to, to, to your daily life. With, you know, the, the court tend to look at it and say, okay, yeah, well, yeah, man, give it to them because after all, you know, it's customary for them to have it. So Guatemala is playing this very, very, very clever game and we are becoming willing accomplices to that game of effective control. Give you a case in point. Now, if this is your house or your backyard, 
Do you need a buyer lease to go to your backyard? No. You just step out, step over there, and you do whatever you want. But here's what we do. The last time, I, I think a delegation under the People's United Party went to uh, to um, the SARS two. They sent a letter. Man, who does that? They sent a letter begging, why please make a community about Canada, man? I mean, that kind of thing. Um, it's all fine. But the point I'm making is that plays into the into the, uh, the, the, the effective control that the Guatemalans wants to show that they have. Because if you have to need a buyer or leave to go the, to go down there, that tells you that you don't have control, you don't own it. So for you to come and insult my intelligence and tell me, don't worry about it, use you know all these fancy terms, you know, you know, try not to perjure yourself as a legal, you know, as a, as a lawyer. When when I know the reality on the ground is entirely different from what you're saying, that to me doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this is where we are now. If we go to the ICG, there's probably a mathematical certainty that we probably gonna lose territory, given the current position or reality on the ground as we speak. Because I've been there. The Guatemalans come and go at will. No one stops them. Oh, there's hundred feet illegal fishing nets. They have a little lady we met, she says that, oh, they don't stop her because she gives the four of her enemies people fry fish. So I mean, you know, I'm just saying, this is the kind of craziness that's going on down here. And you, until you see for yourself, you will not believe it. So this is the game, the very clever game that Guatemala is doing, and we are going Hope line and see the along way to go to the ICJ, where I believe that we will, in fact, probably lose territory. To me, it's a it's a case of how to lose an ironclad case, basically. Because if you say you have an ironclad case, then why is it that you that you are not worried that the fact that Guatemala has in fact annexed and occupied the SARS too? And I deliberately say that because that's what's going on. It's been annexed and occupied. Here's the thing. But under international law, you cannot annex by using deadly force. So hence when me and Brother Patrick and all of us went down there in that contingent, they couldn't use deadly force because, again, it's a very critical thing because they try to prepare themselves for the court, for the ICJ and the Hague. But I can assure you that SARS-2 is annexed and occupied. I've been here several times and it's occupied and it's annexed. So don't, I don't care anybody who comes and tells you otherwise, they should not be believed because they're, 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 they're taking you for full insulting your intelligence. Now, as to what does Guatemala claim? And the, the issue that Clavenda and Lucie said I think it was Dr. Nevarate said that um, they claim from, although in theory, yes, they claim the whole country for the sake of principle, but in officially, what they want is from the Cebu River to the SARS. Do anybody here from Dangriga or Aira or from Cebu? Because if you go from Cebu, you know, we go to Maryland. I mean, under the first day of So, I mean, that's, they basically claim from, if you look at the map, that's about 22,923 square miles of territory, including the beautiful keys out in that, out in that area back there, like the Sapadilla Keys and those other keys out there. So it's not just, it's not just uh, uh, something that you should. I'm trying to make it colloquial, but it's a very serious thing that we're dealing with here, okay? So that's what they claim officially when they issue the they claim out of that. That's what they want to claim from the Cebu River, from the banks of the Cebu River, all the way, and everything back that way. So if you go from that part of the line, my brother, I don't need a passport to go visit you if they get their way. And that's the, and that's the, and that's the reality of it. I will need a passport to visit you if they get their way. Now, so I mentioned that we tried that we are doing everything to unravel the reality of our international borders. And I've showed you why, what we have done. All in the interest of deference, and in some instances, appeasing the Guatemalans, who seem to have no interest in 
ever respecting anything coming out of the Lise's side of the uh, negotiations. You know, I mean, I'm not, I, I try not to get into any kind of um, alarmist or, or, you know, or conspiracy theory about anything, but it is what it is. Um, Belize is being led to the ICJ, and I, and I use the word led, or in some instances frightened to go to the ICJ by some very powerful source, forces that's probably working behind the scenes. Because if you look at the, okay, the French, they, they, have some, they, have some, they have some people called the French of Belize. These are countries, friendly countries, who are acting in the interest of peace. I think the United States, England, Turkey is one of them. Uh, several others comes to mind. Switzerland, they're all, they are all decided to, to, to put together what is called a peace fund to, to, in the interest of promoting the peace for, uh, for between Guatemala and Belize. So far, they have, Guatemala has received up to $40 million, Belize up to $8 million. Also, you know, to, that, this is supposed to go towards the education campaign for the referendum and those kind of things. Um, for example, like in Belize, the, the $10,000 a month office space, I think $120,000 for travel, um, $700,000 towards education campaign, which should include the diaspora, but no, I haven't seen any of them come yet. I'm not going to say anything. Perhaps they will come later. From the, I mean, from the from the MFA, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And here's the thing with them: when they come, see, this is where it gets very. This is where you play with words because when they come, they're not going to give you the pros and the cons of going to the ICJ. They're just going to give you what they believe you should go to the ICJ because everything else is. I see they're a bus, basically. So, which the, 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 the actual document that they signed says that you're supposed to educate the people on the pros and the cons, and let them decide. You, but you don't frighten them into believing that, oh, if I vote, no, A is gonna happen or B is gonna happen. You give them the situation, and then they decide how they want to go with the ICJ. But the ICJ people, like all the ICJ people, and they get upset because they don't want to be referred to as that. But the, um, the proponents, the proponents, and let me use a you know, diplomatically correct word. The proponents of the ICJ um, will, if they ever come speak to you, they will tell you ironclad case, and, and it's the only way, you know, it's the only legal solution. But guess what? They're, most of them are lawyers, the ones that I've met who are, who, are, who's, who presents. And so, the point is, they don't try to give you an education so that you can make an informed decision. To me, they try to give you an education so you can make a misinformed decision. Because you just get all the good things of what the ICJ is all about without looking at the other side of this could happen, that could happen, and there's a high probability that also could happen. And that, these, are, these are facts. Because all these things, we have no guarantee. No one can guarantee us that if we take this case to the ICJ, that we would, the Guatemala would walk away, give the hand in and say, thank you very much, nice don't you believe? We will respect everything that the ICJ says. We have no guarantee about that. In fact, not even the ICJ has the mechanism to enforce any agreement that, any binding agreement that we, that, that the countries make. Because when you go to the ICJ, it believes in, Guatemala is going to ICJ out of a special agreement. You're petitioning the, the you know, UN Security Council, then it's okay, fine, take it to the ICJ under the auspices of the OAS. Fine, they go under a special agreement, but there's no, there's no, the ICJ doesn't have an enforcement mechanism where they say that you don't respect this binding agreement. Binding meaning that whatever judgment comes out of the arbitration, you have, it's not an equity court. It's not about, oh, because I'm a green citizen or I'm a green, no, it's not an equity court. It's a binding arbitration, which is totally different from an equity court. So whatever whatever the ICJ says is law. That's it. You have to respect it. You can appeal it takes X amount of years, I think up to nine years in some instances, but you have to go with what the court says. But you can't, the court doesn't have an army 
The court doesn't have any kind of enforcement mechanism. So if I don't want to respect it, even though I agree to respect it, and knowing what I'm all, giving a history of breaking the rules of belief, I can guarantee you they're not going to respect it if the ruling is adverse to what they believe it should be. And that's what you've got to bear in mind. You're dealing with a serial breaker of every single agreement. Okay? You're not dealing with a, with a, with a partner that respects your rights or respect your position. You're dealing with a, with a military oligarchy that's greedy, that is racist against their own indigenous majority. What makes you think they're going to give cut believers any slack? If they can't stand their own uh, indigenous majority, they can't stand the, the Mayas and the indigenous who are the majority in that country. The, the genocide, many of them are being tried now for crimes against humanity. What makes you think that little old beliefs from the Cebu River down on down they'll respect the rights of people? So you have to understand who your peace partner is. And I'm not saying, I'm not here trying to paint a picture of Guatemala, but you need to know who your enemy is because they're not your friend. They're not your friend. And I'm not saying that the Campesino lady with it, uh, Cebu River with it, I mean, and out in Sarsum out there, said she to give the far operating base people fried fish is your enemy. I'm not just arguing that. I'm simply saying that the, 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 the powers that be in Guatemala City are not to be trusted. I don't trust them. I will never trust them because I see they have a history of trying to compromise the needs. They have a history of disregarding any kind of agreements they make with, with, with Belize. Which takes me to back to the principle of, of uh, effective control. Now, you have a, what is called, I think kind of Brother Patrick mentioned it, but I'm gonna get a little deeper about it. He mentioned it, uh, uh, he, he touched on it, but I'm gonna get into it a little bit more. On a, okay, so if you go to the, if you, let's say, if you, these two parties are, you know, you're in disagreement. So, I can unilaterally you know, like go to the UN Security Council. That's what Nicaragua and them did, Colombia. Yeah, I don't need Guatemala to go to the UN Security Council because I'm a member, I'm a member of the General Assembly. I don't need to have a buy from the Guatemalans. I can go right to the Security Council and say, look, Mr. Security Council, which you have England, China, United States, Russia. I'm sure those countries would want to hear you know, what Belize has to say. In any event, you could go to the UN Security Council and see what is called an advisory opinion. What do I mean by that? Meaning that although it's not a binding resolution, it's respected. It's not binding. That means you don't have to. But it's a respected opinion. Because the, way, the, the, the language that we have going forward for ICJ is so broad, it opens up the leads to wanton speculation by an international body. Because we are not under the advisory position. What we could do is tell, ask the UN Security Council to take this to the ICJ, where we ask for a clarification on the 1859 Borders and Boundaries Treaty, which shows our international borders from Rio Hondo to the SARS-2. From Port Rio Hondo to Old SARS-2, you should say from Port Rio Hondo to no SARS-2. I mean, if you want to look at it from that now, because, I mean, if I go to SARS-2 right now, I am persona non grata. I can't, you know, I guarantee you, they would, I would have to fight my way through, just, you know, but that's the reality. So we can ask, there are other mechanisms that we can do. If we seek an advisory opinion to, to from the UN Security Council to ICJ, at least, at the very least, they could come back and say, well, you know, you don't have anything to lose by it. But as long as the status quo remains in as it is in the SARS, that is to say, Guatemala has effective control of the area, we run a very high probability that if this eventually goes to the ICJ, that we will more than likely lose some territory. And that's the reality. Now, let me just wrap up because you know, I mean, I, I I know you guys wanted to get to the mic and ask some questions. Um, I got my five minutes uh, warning. Um, let me just say this: the focal point at this at this uh, juncture should be on the SARS two and what is occurring down there. Notice what the doesn't want to talk about that. They keep saying 
this should be referred to the ICJ, fine. But in the interim, it's going to take, what, how long do we know? Maybe five to eight years before you can get to the ICJ, and after that, another five years for a judgment? What's going to happen in the interim? If we just, if we just disregard that reality that, about the SARS-2. Hey, that's part of our national anthem. Could you imagine if the United States give up uh, uh, on the racket red glare? Delete that line? Oh my God, they'll be like, Civil War! I mean, so could you, that's what we're going to have to do. Broad Rio Hondo to no SARS-2. That's what it's going to bring them to. And your national anthem is a part of you. It's, it's a part of your culture. It defines who you are. You can tell no American about the, you know, I'm a, I'm a naturalized American citizen. I can tell you. My American friends who were born here, you try to tell them about their national anthem, you, 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 you might be looking for a fight. So you're telling Belize now to, to give up the SARS-2, don't worry about it. That's the attitude. Right, Morgan? Give it up. Nah, don't worry about it. It's just still, uh, like one, I even had official people tell me, goodbye, I don't want to worry about it, mosquito don't all kind of thing. You know, what one, I mean, here we are. This is the mindset that you're dealing with. People telling you to, don't worry about this line in your national anthem that says, old SARS, too, don't worry about it. Because it's, it's just uh, territory. We can give that to Guatemala, it should be fine. Well, I am here to tell you that I don't, I'm not from that school of thought. Like what John Francis said, no one works at that cross. You know what I mean? This is how this should be your mindset. 8,867 square miles. That's what I was in school. That's what they told us. And that's what I'm sticking to. Live or die. 8,867 square miles. No more, no less. I don't want to look for my mama. Who knows still what it's fine. But give me my 8,867. 8, and that's the bottom line. That's where I'm at. I don't know who, but that's where I'm at.